I don't think, do you want to just play around? I don't think it's working right now. Okay. Is it? Oh. Thumbs up. Okay. 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 Alrighty. Um, so I'm excited to see everyone again. Thank you for, for coming to class physically. Um, just on that note, I wanted to, I promised everyone I would show you um, what the web option looks like. I've received some emails about it, so I want to make sure that everyone knows that it's up and running. So if you go on our wonderful Quercus course website by typing q.utoronto.ca, putting in all your little mystical Utah IDs and passwords, um, then you click web option to do open a new tab. And then you can relive the glory. I'll just show the first minute. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Hello. Hey. Hey. See, so I can, so if I, if I really am out of it one day, I can just play last week's lecture while I'm standing up here and lip sync myself. And then, you know. Um, but all jokes aside, I'm really happy that we have that available. Um, you know, I, don't, I can't see whether people are using it or not. I mean, maybe at the end of the year they give me some sort of statistics kit to look. Um, but I'm going to upload a little document I got uh, from talking to uh, someone at the Writing Center. Um, and, and in this document, there are some tips for how to best utilize uh, web option courses. Um, so again, my advice would be to, just as you're already all doing, uh, physically come to class every week and then review problematic parts of the lecture online from the safety of your own homes or viewpoint of your own smartphones. Um, so this week, we move into the first chapter of our textbook and really continue many of the themes that I kind of tried to whet your appetite with last class. Um, so really, we'll be focused on uh, two things. Uh, so the study of society as a discipline, so sociology as the study of human behavior, and then part two, which is intimately connected with that, sociology as a perspective. Um, so we'll be looking at the discipline of sociology and then sociology as a way of seeing things, a way of framing experiences. Um, so I have a slide about that. Uh, so again, seeing first that sociology is a systematic, rigorous, scientific study of social behavior and then a sociological perspective is balancing all of our unique, individual, personal stuff, balancing that with the fact that we live in shared, evolving environments. Now, we're part of not only a species, Homo sapiens, um, but we're part of specific cultures, specific time periods, and here, uh, you're all members of a specific school, U of T. Um, so before getting into all of that, um, I'd like, as I promised, uh, another, another nugget of, of fun in this class. Um, we will present our second peer mentor. So you met Andrew C2 last class, um, and now you will meet Sarah Ann Cox. Um, so give it up for Sarah. Oh. I'm registered, a major 
in human biology and conservation by biodiversity and public policy co op. But on top of the three programs you're allowed to be registered in, I qualify for an additional four minors in sociology, anthropology, love and studies, and AIDS. So I go to school at not learning a lot. Four more years to go. So, uh, just to briefly about my interests, I enjoy learning and teaching. That's why I'm here in front of you guys. That's why I'm here five years in seven programs. I love that so much. I like working with kids. I want to go off with kids at Shelter Canada, and the National Daycares. Uh, I used to play baseball a lot, uh, especially uh, in my years, so I love baseball. I can't play it anymore. Um, and then the last two months, where I was last week and past few weeks. I love animals. I grew up with daughter of an international animal feeder master, and I love traveling to travel around the world my entire life. So just those two things come together in the passion for that work. This is where I was being happy. So I was working for three weeks as volunteer zookeeper at the Belize Zoo and Tropical Education Center in Belize. Uh, and that's through the amazing work with Claude Volunteer, which is an organization that does uh, this. I'm not going to talk too much about what I did this past few weeks. It's amazing. It's a long uh, But what made me important about where I was with more uh, for this class is I was in with the mind as a social, uh, as a global south country. And that was very amazing to have a sociological perspective on what I was doing down there because the society in some ways is similar but in the very particular difference. But the norm down there to pay for the washer. can't pay for the dish. And I'm going to go back to that's not me. Um, so it's just like being able to see a society and study it and understand why it's things that we consider normal here in Western society are not that. So that's what really interests me in this class. Thinking to why I get sociology, because as you know I study programs, and I'm one of them is sociology, but I find sociology is one I love most, I find the most important in all my programs. And that's for the main three reasons. One is an interesting question. Anything that you just walk down the street and saw Walking, and you stop and question why is this person in this situation? Your social factors in this situation. And there's these other like programs that we in school that of course that you understand why science, the way science is, and why the science community is like these conclusions. Society is this shape of science, it shapes everything. It's all people to question why everything the way it is. Uh, and that kind of leads into being able to make your own assumptions. So you're able to double check is this really what I think is true? Really, what knowledge is in society, especially where am I wrong? Society, society to actually create this. There's false perspective of what there is. And finally, as I mentioned, it can be about anything. I have majors and programs in every field besides this and that. It's scary. Um, and I know that every day I'm in the class, I'm what I'm doing in this class. Um, just take this course. If you don't like it, that's fine. You love it. In case you don't, it will help you. That world is right there for So this is just my little takeaway. It's, I sometimes get told that I have my act together. I know exactly what programs I'm going to go when I'm going to grad school. I know everything about that. But I didn't always have my act together. Uh, and I, I came into my undergraduate knowing I wanted to be a corporate lawyer. I think since I was seven years old, I Double major in political science and public policy, and that was that. Business and law. Uh, after my first semester, I realized that I really, really, really cannot stand in politics or business. So that really screwed me over. Uh, so, uh, any plans I had went out the window, and I was in this disastrous so wreck of my life. So, that's where I want to take you away. It's going to happen whether you came in knowing exactly what you wanted to do, and you have no idea. You're going to find yourself in a situation in the next four years of your life where you really are like, I am a disaster, I can purpose, I can go forward. So that's why I just want to help you. You just need to breathe because everything will be okay. You will survive this. It's not the kind of start goal. Uh, and then you need to like, explore and think, could it be okay? I thought about what do I like. I like biology and blood tests. So I said, I want to take a biology I explore and I ask for help at that by the career center, and I figured out what exactly I liked. And then I went into it, realized I could study it, realized I was good at it. And then I found what I wanted to go into medical law. And that's medical policy law, national law, medical policy law, 
combination of those words in some order, it's exactly what I love doing. And so I got to where I am today because I calmed down my thought, I explored every field, see as many fields as if I didn't think I would be good at it, I'd be good at it, and I would love, and then I made it to where I am today. So that's my like, one giveaway to give away to you guys, is if this happens to you soon or it happens to you in the future, it's going to happen, you're going to be okay. And before I turn it back over to Andrew to talk about SOS, yeah. um, I just wanted to mention we are hosting our first office hours next week. I said we, I mean me, uh, on Wednesday, which I believe is the 27th. Yeah, 27th. 26th. 26th. Whatever next Wednesday is, 26th, I think. We sound right. Um, and they're going to be from 11 to 1, so that's two hours. We may probably won't be all two hours because we're just blocking it up for questions. It's going to be MW324. So if you know where Lauren's office is, which I recommend you all go to office hours, by the way, they're amazing. It's just down that hallway right here. We'll give you probably more information than of maps and imposed on purpose, but that focuses on transitioning both in academic and in campus life, so to help better get you going. Uh, I don't know how many of you uh, went through an orientation or get started, but we're going to be really making that kind of making sure you really got it up and end up on everything. So I'm going to pass it up to you guys. Yes. This is so crazy. Give her a chance, I can correct um, So I just want to just speak briefly about getting involved on campus, especially with this class. So with essentially every other department of student association, most positions are elected through elections. And you can find out most information online through, for example, Facebook. Every departmental student association have a page. If you can't find anything, you can visit ulife.utronco.ca. And you can also find out what folks as well if you're interested in it. Uh, but for DSAs as a whole, I, I would strongly recommend joining one because you have so much opportunity to really create events and programming for yourself. Like for me, I have the chance to create alumni networking events uh, panels on uh, sexual violence and harassment, uh, workplace safety, and previous work. So there's literally everything and anything for you if you are interested in getting involved as a whole. Uh, if you can't find anything, feel free to email me and I can uh, connect you with whoever. Um, I would say I'm pretty well connected to the people that are in their career positions. So again, like, feel free to reach out to me as a whole. And enjoy class. is gone. Here you are. Uh oh. The mouse went nuts. It's gone. Okay. All right. I got it. It's just going bizarre. All right. So again, we have introduced the idea that obviously we're all in this room studying sociology, and by the end of the year, we would love to be able to automatically apply what's known as the sociological, sociological perspective to everything we see and everything we do. So let's get there together. Oops. Okay, so this notion of the sociological perspective, or seeing things uh, with a bird's eye to the system level or the macro level. Um, all of you that did your quizzes will, will know what, what the term macro means, but we'll be explaining that later. Um, so keeping close attention to both the macro big picture and the micro small picture individual levels is something sociologists are keenly interested in. Now, why is doing or having this twin focus important to sociologists. This twin focus arguably began with the work of C. Wright Mills, or sometimes called Charles Wright Mills in the textbook. Um, his full name, of course, is Charles, or that's his first name, uh, but he's typically C. Wright Mills. So if you see a C. Wright Mills or a Char Charles Wright Mills or 
Charles W. Mills or some variation of those names, it's the same person. Um, but he's a key, key person that will come up um, either explicitly and directly or implicitly and indirectly uh, in pretty well any sociology course that you may take going forward. Um, so C. Wright Mills in 1959, towards the end of his career, wrote a paramount piece of work called The Sociological Imagination. Mills was reflecting on the historical development of American sociology, which, as we'll see later in the lecture, largely developed in what was called a positive mode. Now, positive doesn't just mean uh, what it means in the colloquial or everyday sense of the word. So positive as opposed to negative, uh, meaning charged or good or moving forward. Positivism as a scientific approach or method to studying things has some similarity with that meaning of the everyday word of positive, um, but as we'll see, it's more about developing what are called positive principles. Um, so rules of study that can be applied to any set of phenomena. So that will sound abstract for now, but we'll build up into what that means. So to see the context in which C. Wright Mills was writing, he was speaking against what he saw was the dominance of this positive perspective. As basically sociologists kind of saying, these are the rules by which we study social life, um, and let's apply these rules, and let's do good research, and find out why people behave the way that they do. C. Wright Mills liked the fact that sociologists had developed a series of principles, but felt that we had kind of reached a place in the 1940s and 1950s where we were simply using these rules almost dogmatically um, or religiously. We weren't really thinking about what it is that sociology is really about. Um, he feels we've kind of lost our way, or we lost our way at that time, uh, moment in time. So C. Wright Mills, uh, what inspired him to become critical of the discipline in this way were, was his focus on what he called personal troubles. So America, as you may or may not know, is often known for its rather individualistic spirit um, or ethos. Ethos meaning uh, essentially a governing mentality or set of ideas in a society. So the West, such as America, kind of seen as a core Western nation in contemporary times, is often framed against Asian societies, often China. Um, America and the West are often seen as promoting individualism, where Eastern countries are often seen as promoting collectivism. And that's something we'll see later in the course. Um, but C. Wright Mills was very critical of this focus on the individual and individuality. He noticed that in the 40s and 50s, many individuals were suffering dire poverty. And instead of seeing their social problems uh, or, or, or the poverty they were experiencing as systematic, uh, systematic as being, uh, you know, a condition of being part of the working class, um, being underprivileged, not having access to prestigious positions. Instead of being critical of things in society, he found that largely due to this set of ideas around individual responsibility, individual work ethic, and so on and so forth, in his contemporary West, that people tended to frame all of their life's issues as uniquely their own. Um, so rather than seeing our, each of our individual problems as connected to the societies that we live in, as part of long histories, things as we'll see later in the course, um, things having to do with broad social problems like sexism, racism, ageism, xenophobia, all sorts of things that people have to deal with um, in, in the contemporary Canada and America and other societies, instead of seeing many of their own personal troubles as connected to those things, um, he found that people were not doing that, and more critically, 
in a way, he blamed sociologists uh, for, for not helping people see this issue. So if sociologists were unable to help inform people about how their lives are connected to society and shaped by social institutions, what good are we really doing? So C. Wright Mills, you'll see in any introductory textbook, mainly for him, his, his rallying cry for making sociologists actually do socially impactful work. And it's not that any of that work hasn't been done in the past, but the tendency to build formal models and try to be really scientific, C. Wright Mills found was at odds, at odds with the discipline's more humanitarian impulse. Um, so this humanitarian impulse inherent in the discipline, again, as a, as a discipline that is studying variation, inequality, stratification, the core uh, kind of material outcome that C. Wright Mills saw as, again, very importantly, not just an academic end, but something needed in American society of his time in the 1950s, was this concept of the quality of mind. Now, as the textbook notes, sometimes C. Wright Mills is mistaken as implying that people weren't as intelligent as they could be. So quality of mind taken literally may seem to be a somewhat negative insult, saying, you know, people don't have the quality of mind to understand that things are socially constructed. That's not really what he meant. What he meant was people do have a quality of mind always, but unfortunately the quality of mind that has been cultivated in America roughly 60 years ago was this tendency to individualize one's problems, to not connect things to broader institutions, to not see oneself as part of something larger. So he wanted to shift that and reframe that. Um, and he developed a term, because uh, C. Wright Mills was kind of a motorcycle riding, like really radical guy, um, and so he, he got really upset and passionate sometimes. Um, and he would refer to both uh, lay people, so in academia, a lay person is just someone um, that's a non-academic. Um, it's someone that uh, doesn't have really studied opinions on things, but is just kind of, you know, doing their own thing. And so he wasn't just calling lay people this term, but also other academics who didn't emphasize this importance of connecting the individual with the social. He, la he labeled them cheerful robots. Um, so this was, in his mind, uh, the quote-unquote organization man or organization person. The person who simply accepted the roles that society provided them, and even if they had some sort of discontent, which they often did, would tend to, again, personalize those issues. Rather than embarking on social change, maybe would embark on personal change, but more often, personal resignation, personal feelings of guilt, and as we'll see next week, which all the classical thinkers, such as Marx, Durkheim, Weber, Hobbes, Machiavelli, pretty much everyone you can think of, um, this central problem of feeling alienated in society. So rather than try to change uh, the world, become uh, more in dialogue with the world, people were really becoming quite emotionally upset. Um, so sociology, again, by connecting the individual with the social in this way, uh, I think has a, has a unique vantage point for being particularly humanitarian in what it does. Um, so, so C. Wright Mills uh, is figure number one. I'll go on to figure number two, and then we'll kind of open it up with some questions. Um, so again, C. Wright Mills, key in any sociology class for developing this concept of the sociological imagination, which as we'll see now is used in contemporary societies as the sociological perspective. Basically always trying to see where the individual meets the social. Uh, Peter Berger wrote uh, a famous book um, in the 60s called uh, The Social Construction of Reality. Berger followed, just a couple of years later, he followed Mill's rallying cry for 
raising people's consciousnesses out of their individual lives and into their social lives. Kind of, in a way, forcing people to see, hey, yes, I agree that you are a totally unique person, but you're also shaped by a totally non-unique context. Your context is shared. Your environment is shared. You are who you are, and I won't take that away from you, um, but part of why you're who you are, part of why you have the desires you do, uh, those are strongly shaped by the time and the place that you're in. So Peter Berger, his, if C. Wright Mills is known as having the sociological imagination and trying to get people to have this quality of mind where they're always connecting their experiences with those of people and places around them, Peter Berger takes this to a slightly more theoretical level and says, well, anytime you see something that seems particular, meaning a kind of one-off, isolated event, um, or one person or something, see it as being part of a more general category. So if you see, a st a, again, using the example of homelessness from last class, if you see one individual experiencing homelessness, or what you imagine to be, if you see them lying on a park bench downtown or something, if you see one person experiencing that, try to see the general through that experience. So as you see that person, think, oh, what kind of society are we living in where someone may be sleeping on a park bench? Um, and, and so, again, it's this idea of any time you see one lone event, question, is this something extremely unique, novel, and idiosyncratic? Or is it part of a broader issue? If I'm having issues in this class, or in school, or with my mental health, or whatever the issue is, is that totally unique to me, or are there other people also experiencing similar issues? Asking those sorts of questions really helps you learn, again, how things that are personal may be unique to you, or to the person you're looking at, but also have these shared elements. And analytically, that then enables you to say, hey, this thing that I thought was a one-off problem is actually widespread. So maybe we should do what we'll be see later in the course um, is called the enactment of systemic change. So again, sociology as a science is trying to establish patterns. And the first way you establish patterns is by extrapolating or drawing out from one case general themes and patterns. Okay, so, uh -huh. um, so question number one. So you'll see if you have the, um, and then I'll, I'll do my little activity thing. I'll have little activities in every lecture or so um, that will keep trying to motivate you to physically come to class. Um, but the, because the questions and everything else will be posted online. Um, so maybe if I could try to motivate this, maybe if you want to, Throw it around or be the thrower. So Sarah will be the, the voice enabler. That's what, so whoever has that is called the voice enabler. Um, so we have question number one. How would we look at universities if we're to see them as strange instead of familiar? So just for more context, it's in the textbook and I tried to say it with the general and familiar. Peter Berger again said, Think of something you totally take for granted, like the elementary school system or a hospital, and try to think, okay, that's not strange to me. I know why that institution exists, um, or I know why the, these two people are fighting, or whatever the, the, the object is. Peter Berger challenges all of you to look at something you take for granted and see as familiar, and that you think you have figured out, and to see it as bizarre or unusual. So as a thought experiment, if you were to see that universities were strange, if you were to think, hey, why the heck do people sit in this lecture? Why are 400 people listening to one person? Why do they care about their grades? Why do they want jobs? If you were to see this as strange rather than familiar, how might you look at the university? Anybody? 
That's her number one. So, um, what I think about her is one of two things. Okay, uh, so it would either be that, uh, let's say we would think of a uh, university in our own, and we wouldn't actually think about the society stuff, right? So we would be, we would ask uh, questions like, why are they? All these people sitting here, <coughs> listening to one person, um, and we might like the idea that for education, we want to come to university and we want to learn, um, and we want to expand our um, knowledge, or we would, um, well, we wouldn't waste our time, uh, or uh, like we wouldn't want to actually come to university. Like, see, the thing is that right now, I think society has um, made it so that everyone goes to university or college, gets a degree, right? But if you were to look at it in our own um, view, it would be different. I don't think we would see as many people as there are um, right now in university and colleges. Great promise. Anyone else? What's Andy? Uh, I thought already to what he said, but what I want to add was, as well as we, as a society, encourage university after high school, because it was strange, because no one in my high school actually didn't go, even if they, like, people for the first year, they would go with them after that to the university. But I think it's interesting as a society where we associate success with university instead of, like, you going to a career or like being a plumber or whatever it is that you can do without like an education and we see that and we associate it with something that's not success, which in some of the findings could be success if it's not associated with the PhD or master. Oh great. Thanks. Lots of engagement. Go. So um, I think if we saw universities and if we considered the purposes for why people go to university so much more often nowadays than you did, say, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago. Um, what you I think will, that, that will cause us to start asking other questions. Um, a question like, um, what, kind of, what kind of things are happening in our economy that cause so much more jobs to require the university degree? Uh, now that where whereas for example 20 years ago they might not have um, and then from that we might ask another question like what are the specific causes for for these, uh, these job requirements um, they're obviously trying to screen out people with lower education and so that they can get the people but then but then when an arms race develops between people continually getting higher education and jobs requiring higher higher education. You gotta ask yourself now, well, how does that end up? What is the end point of that? Can that be slowed down or stop or hurt? Or should it be? And even how can we change the education system as a whole to fit the way in which we work and the way we qualify for jobs? Great point. Google, I don't know if you're familiar. Um, Google, I mean, obviously you're familiar with Google. Um, so, or no, maybe but Google recently, one of their head recruiters uh, made a, a rather bold public statement where they said, you know, actually, we're going to start recruiting coders based on, like, evidence of ability. So people, because, you know, I don't know if you know much about computer coding, uh, but there's a whole bunch of boot camps and ways to self-learn coding. Um, so I think many digital companies are starting to say, uh, you know, is taking a computer science degree really the best training for something you can learn on your own? And there's been actually, not, not to scare people that are in first year university away from the university, I'm someone that's deep in it myself, um, but there is a growing movement of, of uh, publicly available online education. Um, that's part of why I opted for the web option, because I would have felt kind of hypocritical not doing that, um, given, given that uh, that's, that's something I've been studying a lot myself. 
uh, this is the growth of that industry. Okay, so anyone, I think there was a hand up there. Okay, you'll toss it. It won't hurt you if it hit you. Oh. Yay, okay. Two in the front. You can throw it to me and then I'll pass it. Do do do. No, that's great. So isn't it strange that in high school, things are so much more kind of regimented, and then, boom, first year, you're on your own, and it's up to people like me to keep you on track. No, I'm joking. It's not. I want you to stay on track, but I won't make you. Yeah, like an apprenticeship kind yeah. of thing. Um, but now you have to actually come sit and sit in a chair and actually watch lectures and all that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I have a question about um, like the way that you guys think about like your education system and how it should be. Touchdown. Or 
Right? Why not? Another thing that can just come to mind when you're thinking about What's strange about it is, um, you know, if you look at it right now, you say, well, isn't it strange that so few people uh, go to university or that so, there are so many kinds of people that tend to not go or to go later in life? Um, and then looking really far back, so I actually one of my, my first courses I took at, at U of T was called the Anthropology of Education. And in that class, I learned that the university inherently was very uh, stratifying. Um, so only the most elite individuals could go. It was extremely expensive. It still is, but it was just much more expensive um, and, and much harder to get into. Um, and over time, the university has opened up. The idea of an education, of a liberal education, is giving access of education to everyone. But as we know, not everyone can afford to go, uh, not everyone can take the time off work, and not everyone can even get into a university. Um, so the institution itself is torn. Um, and, and this is where I, I, I mentioned the question of even having grades and evaluations. Um, it, on the one hand, it's an institution designed to level the playing field for people, but at the same time, different people have di very hugely different uh, levels of advantage uh, in the university system people that can put in the time um, that have been parented a certain way geared towards university versus those who haven't. Um, so great, I love, love this kind of interaction. Okay, and this is good. Now that I know the class is so vibrant and dynamic and engaged, you might, this is a, a, a little pocket for me to say something about um, the slides and the general pedagogy. Um, I will always post the slides uh, and the slides, you'll see most of them are my kind of renderings uh, of the textbook. Um, so if I don't cover a slide, that doesn't mean it's not important, it just means we ran out of time. But given that you're so vibrant and engaged, um, I'll, try to, I'll try to tweak the timing of the, of the lecture um, so that I can make sure I cover everything that I actually put up. Um, but again, this is, this is an evolving course, so, so we'll see how that works. Um, so on that note of, you know, ideally everyone having access to, the, to university education and being able to be, you know, empowered and enlightened and all these things and given critical thought, all these things we like to think the university can do. Um, but given the fact that uh, access to university is unequally distributed, it's a great moment to bring up another uh, set of key concepts that shape the discipline of sociology and the sociological perspective. So these are the twin concepts of structure and agency. Now, agency is the concept you think of when you say, hey, I'm Lawrence or whoever I am, um, and my life is my own, I have free will, I can do things if I'm determined. Conversely, if I, if I slack off, if I don't do work, it's my fault. Agency refers just very simply to the human capacity to form our own lines of action, to be autonomous, um, and to have independence. Now, again, very key, sociolo early sociologists, even beginning with August Comte in the 1700s, who we'll get to, um, but especially C. Wright Mills, um, sociologists kind of claim to fame was tempering um, or, or somewhat offsetting the, the focus on agency by focusing on structure. So yes, I, as Lawrence, can do a whole lot of things and make a whole lot of choices of my own. But the choices that I can make are shaped by the networks that surround me. So that can be in a very literal sense. So let's say I want to get a new job. That might be much easier for me if I literally have networks in a line of work. Let's say I say, hey, I really want to, you know, I, I really want to work at a call center. And I know a call center manager. Maybe I can try to get a job through that manager. Now that's an obvious sense of structure. It's something that can enable my agency or it can limit it. If I don't know anyone in any jobs, it will be difficult for me to get a job. If I don't know anyone that can show me what a resume looks like, 
um, how to perform well in an interview, e exercising my own agency, my own capacity to go out and get that job, that would be more difficult than for someone who is connected, knows what a good resume looks like, uh, and all of those things. Um, and so, so structure works even deeper than that too. So there's the more tangible structure in the form of people and in the form of money, uh, people that can actually take time off work, that can quit. Um, you know, employment insurance works as a form of structure. It enables you to leave a job temporarily if you're fired or laid off, um, and then try something new. Um, structure gets more complicated, though, when you, when you think of the more intangible things. Um, so there's one thing to say, yes, we're all in control of our actions, and we can do whatever we like. Um, but sociologists try to see everything that structures a person's or group of person's decisions. So to make it personal, um, you know, I often think about when and why I chose to drop out of school. Um, for me, it, you know, I dropped out formally when I was 16, but I really kind of checked out of school when I was in grade two. Um, I had a lot of, it's kind of weird, I know, I know it's grade two, but I'm always, you'll, you'll see that, I'm, I've fixated my, my clearest memory, or my most like diluted memory, is when I'm eight years old, and everything in my life, I think all my decisions come back to eight-year-old Lawrence. Um, but eight-year-old Lawrence, you know, I was like, in my mind, I was like, I was a gamer, and I didn't get along with other kids, and that structured, so that's kind of intangible, you know, like I don't know what it was about me that did that. Um, my sister was hospitalized at, at sick kids with anorexia. Um, you know, she was kind of at death's door at that time. My parents were focusing on that. I think I escaped into games. Um, and that structured kind of my whole adolescent development and even now. You know, I, as I, I can joke around with like, compulsive gaming and, and saying, you know, I, I studied video game addiction because I dropped out to play games. Um, but for me, that, that's a deep structure in my life. Um, and again, I think a benefit of studying sociology is you can see how structured our lives are without just thinking of the obvious things. You think, you know, what was it in your life that made you the person that you are? Am I just naturally a gamer or was it something I used to escape which then I really became to enjoy, and which now is a deep part of me, that whether I like it or not, I can't really change. And I don't really want to change it. That's why I have phones on, uh, games on my phone right now. So, you know, people are, co people are complicated. Um, so all of that was just a personal example to say, upbringing, for many reasons, shapes the structure or the contours. I think thinking of structure at a personal level, um, you might hear the informal expression, you know, the contours of a person's life, all the things that make them up. Their upbringing, the way they were raised, the way they get along with their family, where they grew up, their race, class, gender, all these things. Things, things that sociologists study at a more macro level, like ethnicity and gender and things like that, but also all these more seemingly personal experiences. Um, and I know, by being part of a gaming community, um, that m my experiences, which I felt were totally unique to me, are actually very widespread among many other gamers um, that started playing for similar reasons. Um, so, now I don't, so this is where the interactive activity comes in. Um, because, you know, I do know it's a, a big space with lots of people and all that. Oh, I might, I might need my peer mentor assistance, can you help me open up my goodies? Um, so, because this is a large introductory class, and I am trying to personalize it, um, both with you know, information about myself, but also having peer mentors, um, I'd like you to, I, men I mentioned the funny term last class, um, but I really mean it, uh, I'd like you to develop or form um, a lifelong study buddy in this classroom. Um, yeah, I don't know why I can't open this. I'm so, you know, I can't open this damn thing. And I don't want to use, I don't want to be gross and use my teeth. Ugh, I can't open it. Okay, she can, see? It's only gross if I do it. It's not, it's because, okay. I'm trying to keep my formalism. Okay, so if you take one and pass it, oh, I'll just give you, thanks. And pass it around. 
I'll just be running around. Uh, I'm going up there anyway. Okay. okay. okay I can so the just take side. one and pass it on? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So. Oh, if you want to pass these two. So there should be enough. There's like 500. Um, take one, pass it around, pass it back, all that. There should be a couple hundred extra. I just want to make sure I have a lot. Um, so on your little um, cue card, I guess it is, uh, well, before, I'd like you to introduce yourself to the person next to you, either your left or right. Um, you know, if you're on an end, someone next to you, or move over to someone near you, um, and just ask each other, you know, name, what you're planning on majoring in, and then you don't have to ask something that, that deep, but think, you know, when you're looking at this question, does thinking of your life's choices in terms of structure and agency is that giving you, is that inspiring any thought in you right now about being in this classroom, about having the friends you have, about anything? Is it just making you think about anything? And then so you might, you, 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 these are little business cards, so think of them as your study buddy's business card. So you'll have their name, you'll have their major, you'll have their email or phone number, and then you'll think about how they think about agency and structure. So you can keep these. Okay, so again, the goal, because you're going to have to do interviews later, the goal is to interview your study buddy and say, what's your name? What's your major? What's your email or phone number? Whatever they're comfortable giving. Um, and then ask them, has this discussion of structure and agency made them rethink anything in their life? And again, you don't have to be as personal as you want. We all have different like, thresholds. Yeah. All righty. Okay. So hopefully now you've formed a tight pair bond with your neighbor. Um, and you're always going to sit beside each other and become the best of friends, take the same majors, have the same issues in classes. No, hopefully not. Um, do Excel at the same pace, all that stuff. Um, your first year, you're going to know these people for three, four, five, six, eleven years, the way I do. So um, I still know people from my undergrad first year class, still friends. Uh, so I hope you do the same. Okay. Um, so when you're exercising that budding sociological imagination uh, that you're going to be developing over the year, as I said, the more complex part is when you think of those intangible um, structuring components of our lives. All the little interactions we've had, the habits we've formed, the context we've been in. That stuff's kind of murky to study. You know, you think, how as a sociologist do I study all of the complexity of people's lives? Well, uh, many of those complexities can be distilled into a few broad categories. Um, so remember, sociologists, like any scientist, are trying to infer or generalize broader principles out of individual phenomena, right? We want to know if you see a certain event or object or person um, or a kind of experience, how that can be extrapolated into a wider theory theoretical understanding of, of what that person's going through or what that event means. So we want to, to speak beyond the case, as we'll see. Um, so five major categories that you'll see throughout the course. There, there are many others, um, but these highly shape uh, the contours of a person's life and all those more intangible components of, of their experiences. Um, so number one, minority status. Um, so broadly construed, a minority is anyone 
uh, whose you know one of their characteristics or a part of themselves is not shared with the majority of the people they're living with. So you could be an ethnic minority. Um, you know, in a country like Canada, that's roughly 85% white. Um, if you're non-white, you're an ethnic minority, uh, or you're a visible minority uh, if, if you're visibly seen as not being white. In different countries where there's a different racial majority, a white person could be a minority race there. Um, minority, that's in terms of ethnicity. It applies to gender as well. Um, so if you're in a workplace that's dominated by males, being female or feminine identified or trans identified uh, or non-binary, being any of those statuses could uh, make you be a minority in that workplace. Um, so sexual minorities, linguistic minorities, basically anything where you know, a part of yourself is not represented as much as that same part of another person is represented. Um, so minority status, again, gender is a separate category. To, uh, then, you know, again, minority status, as I said, is very broad. All of those other categories could fit within it to an extent. Um, but typically minority, again, if you're, if you're thinking about it in, in, in uh, hard terms, it's that you are part of the population minority wherever you are. So you're the only person like yourself on some dimension. Um, or very few of you exist, or you're, it's disproportionate. Um, other common categories uh, studied in sociology, gender, um, again, things like the gender division of labor, the fact that men and women often enter into different kinds of occupations, women historically have made less money, women often hit what's called the glass ceiling, it's uh, harder for women to get kind of high level uh, positions and jobs uh, due to kind of historical norms about what work is um, and what masculinity and femininity are. Um, gender also shapes the kind of dress people wear, the attitudes we have, all of these things. So, so the agency, the kind of person you want to be, if you want to be really aggressive or you want to be really passive, uh, those can be shaped by the gender you identify with. Um, again, anyone can resist these things, um, but as a sociologist, you think, looking at the broad population, what patterns do we tend to see um, in, in these groups? Um, and then socioeconomic status, again, your agency is shaped, I, I use the example of the university, your agency, your ability to do really well in your classes is shaped by the kind of school you went to, what your parents taught you about the value of education, the kind of friends you have. Socioeconomic status is the umbrella term for your wealth, so the amount of money, the, sa the savings you have, um, the kind of education you already have, and the income you both currently make and are projected to make, and what your parents make and all of that. Um, so related to that is family structure. So are you in a single parent home? Um, are you an orphan? Do you have uh, a two parent home? Do you have gay parents? Are you living with your grandparents? These sorts of things, again, may, sh may shape both your status as a minority um, but also your socioeconomic status. You may have more or less ability to exert your will in the world and make your own free choices um, if you are you know, relatively privileged in that extent. Um, and then lastly, and most connected, maybe might seem the most, uh, not, not irrelevant, but um, not as immediately relevant, um, given that you know, we're in a major kind of city, Toronto, uh, but urban-rural differences. So, Times change and things change, but that category was actually the biggest, I would say, um, of these categories in shaping the formation of sociology and the sociological imagination. Um, so we'll get to the Industrial Revolution, um, but urban and rural uh, refer to, well, rural is when people lived mostly scattered, uh, heterogeneous population distributions, which is a fancy way of saying you had a lot of people scattered around, um, so less people in each spot, so a lot of people living on individual farms, um, so small households of like five to ten people um, in large plots of land, scattered around, so being self-sufficient. Um, that's when Canadian, American, and many other societies would be categorized as rural. 
Um, but now we've shifted predominantly to urban living. So people living in major urban centers like Toronto, where you have tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands, millions of people living in close quarters. Um, as you'll see, all of the social thinkers that we'll study in this course were very interested in the transition from rural to urban life and all the pros and cons that that brought along with it. So moving, to, uh, consolidating people in closer quarters enabled people to build fantastic cities, develop infrastructure more fully, um, develop you know, more clubs, more sorts of institutions, all of these things. Um, but it also forced many people out of their accustomed way of life um, and brought people in close quarters also to the extent um, that things like uh, transmittable diseases went up, uh, lifespans went down for a period of time, all sorts of things you see with the Industrial Revolution. Um, so again, thinking of yourself now, the question might be slightly more, um, you know, not, not as extreme as this, but if you think of yourself and you say, well, if I grew up in a rural environment, may I have some tighter connections with a smaller number of people than someone who grew up in a cosmopolitan environment and knows a ton of people, but maybe doesn't really know them that well. Um, those are the kind of stereotypes that are borne out in the data when, you, when we interview people uh, raised in small towns versus major cities. Um, that, that the kind of networks, again, structure as a network, those are very different for those kinds of people. Um, so again, in this course, we'll be balancing um, the broad historical uh, theoretical formation of the field and the discipline, um, seeing how categories have changed over time. Um, so gender, for example, as well, was not studied nearly as much as it should have been in the past, um, largely due to the, the major dominance of male thinkers in the past. Um, and again, that's something that's uh, attempting to be changed now over time. Um, so the historical development, now, so this stage of the lecture, again, it's a sociological imagination. You may be wondering why we're throwing in history and everything. The next two weeks, and I'll say it up front, the next two weeks are quite dense. Um, they are, you know, they're, they're two weeks on theory, classical and contemporary. Um, but after discussing these two weeks with this introduction, um, we'll then get into the assignment and hopefully why I ask you to engage with theory will make sense. And so the purpose of this week, because these ideas will, will pretty well all be revisited next week. Um, if you're struggling to keep up with the names and all of that, feel free to ask questions during. Um, but the point, again, is just to introduce you and sensitize you to what you'll be reading next week and the week after. Um, again, this is a very broad week in its ambitions. Um, so... The birth of sociology as a discipline, as I said last class, sociology is a relatively recent academic discipline. Um, it started roughly in the 1700s. Uh, it was pretty well a direct output or outgrowth of what was known as the scientific revolution. So the scientific revolution was a period in the modern West, for the purposes of this course, because it's, if we're going to be focused on Canada and, a, and somewhat on America, um, the scientific revolution occurred when a series of individuals who were very interested in understanding how individuals organize themselves, um, how the natural world can be studied, um, how uh, moral rules for living can be seen in a scientific way, all of these sorts of different questions. Um, the scientific revolution was essentially when faith in science ultimately started to uh, trump or replace faith in religion. So this was the first kind of moment where um, you know, religious teachings had always somewhat piecemeal been questioned. People have always been critical of things. Um, but the scientific revolution marked the, the switch uh, or the, the dominance of science over religion. And I'll kind of give you a trajectory of how that happened over time. Um, and so this idea of science coming to replace religion, to August Comte, 
um, who is the, the, seen as the major founder and pioneer of sociology, um, to August Comte, now that we believed we could study everything in the world using rational, logical, and very importantly, empirical, verifiable, falsifiable principles, going out and testing things rather than thinking this is just how things are um, or they are, they're coming from another realm. Thinking that you can test, verify, falsify, and really argue things in life, but that you can also develop principles to live by. So rules that we know, things about atoms, things about organs, things about you know, poison, that certain things you just can't eat as a human, um, and that humans and animals vary in terms of what they can eat. All of these kind of stable, static rules. This, to August Comte, marked the beginning of an intellectual revolution. So he, to explain this process, which you'll see many sociologists use in other words, he created a general kind of evolutionary theory of his own. And this was that societies, if kind of left to their own devices, um, so not ones where they're ruled by major tyrannical political leaders that kind of force them to do things, um, but what we would now consider to be modern democracies, like Canada and America, um, in, in societies where uh, groups could or self-organize uh, and, and, and distribute themselves, you would see them go through these three phases. So number one is the theological phase. So every society, even beginning with the smallest tribe, begins um, in a highly religious mode. Uh, there are many anthropological studies which reinforce this sort of view. We'll see this with Emile Durkheim. Um, this is the theological phase, is when individuals first start to see their humanity, including their individuality and their capacity for social interaction. They see it as either a gift or a curse from some other force. Um, so there's something otherworldly that's driving human behavior. Um, so rituals are followed, uh, norms are followed, and taboos and edicts are created. Um, so things like the Ten Commandments, um, origin myths like about Adam and Eve, um, these dominate societies in this phase. Um, so now all societies, according to Kant, begin this way, and all societies, if left relatively to their own devices, will then move on to what he calls the metaphysical phase. So just as people kind of naturally and spontaneously started to develop um, different but similar religious ideas, so like Christianity, Buddhism, all sorts of different religions, uh, Judaism, all of these things emerged with different beliefs, but sharing a similar thing about there being um, you know, some other force governing our behavior, just as we spontaneously arrived at that stage, the human mind, being you know, the beautiful processing organism that it is, then starts to doubt those principles. You'll see that becomes key, key, key in the criticism of Comte, ironically. Um, so in the metaphysical phase, people start to doubt um, the myths that have been constructed. They start to doubt also the rules of the societies that they're living in. They start to doubt the goals that are being taught to them. Um, so in the metaphysical stage, it's marked by questioning and challenging. So you could say, are we in that kind of moment, ironically, again now, when so many things um, are being called into question when you think of um, you know, issues facing us in the world? Um, and that's a point I'll come back to. So we start with a religious mentality as we're searching for meaning, searching for early formulations of theoretical understanding, uh, a little bit, really seeing the beginning of the sociological imagination of saying, hey, maybe my personal experiences are similar to yours. We're both being shaped by God. Um, and then saying, is it really God or is it something else? Is it, is it my mind? Is it my body? Um, is it the neighborhood? What is it? After this sort of deliberation, uh, where people are complicating and challenging things, Comte is then, po is then positive that societies will reach what he calls the positive stage. And so what he imagined have happening 
And this is kind of the central criticism against him, but also his key contribution. So something we'll revisit, you know, is, is again, no ideas are totally pure or totally right or wrong in most cases. The positive stage for him is when a society has gone through these earlier phases. They've developed myths, they've then negated some of those, and now they've become rational and scientific. They say, uh, we need to stop asking questions that can't be answered. We need to go after things that can be verified. So the birth of sociology came at this stage, when people said, you know, rather than asking these very philosophical questions about social interaction and the mind, why don't we go out and survey people? Why don't we see, um, you know, do people in different regions hold different values about the same topics? Uh, do people that are born in lower population density areas, uh, do they enter different vocations even if the same kinds are available? Uh, do people's personalities change over the course of their life? Uh, you saw all sorts of scientific disciplines emerge starting in the 1700s. Um, the, the, the major uh, strengthening of biology, physics, uh, chemistry, people trying to find natural laws and principles. So Comte was key for bringing this line of thought into a domain that was previously metaphysical. People have always been discussing the nature of social interaction, but before Comte, they hadn't been doing it in this sort of scientific way. Now, as we'll see, as much as Comte is lauded, which means like respected and, and liked for doing that, um, for promoting a positivism, he's, I would say, more so criticized than he is lauded for doing that. So the perspective that he really thought society was in and that we should be following is positivism. Um, and so this is just here, um, a theoretical perspective that considers all understanding to be based on science. So essentially it's, and, and this will hopefully tie into what I said about C. Wright Mills, because this is exactly what C. Wright Mills was talking against. Um, he endorsed this, but thought this was going too far. So Comte said, okay, we don't have to be navel-gazing and asking all of these complex questions like Descartes and Locke and Spinoza and all these philosophers you may or may not know. We don't need to be asking that. We've reached the scientific stage. We now know that we can just study things as they are. We can empirically document the rules, the world, and we can develop laws based on that. Now that sounds good and positive in the sense of generative of rules of, of life, but many thinkers rejected this. Um, and not only just sociologists, many philosophers, um, and even many scientists. Um, so if positivism is, uh, has these three tenets, so that there is an objective, knowable reality, that you can explain any topic in one way, and that research is value-free, because we're just good scientists doing good science, anti-positivism questions all of those tenets. So, if, and, and again, you just have to use your sociological imagination, even your early imagination, to think about why they may be critical of these, of these tenets. So let's see tenet number one. There exists an objective, knowable reality. This tenet seems simple enough that there's an objective world we can all see. However, when I talked about the rather intangible elements of structure and agency, you know, and even, even without thinking of structure and agency, so getting rid of all the jargon, the idea that there can be one single objective reality minimizes the possibility of what, what you'll see later in the course is called the partiality of perspective. That the fact that people disagree over so many things does that mean that one person is right and all of the other people are wrong? So for example, think of religion. Think of all the different religious systems that contradict one another, but yet are all believed in. There is no single objectively valid religion if you're talking to you know, a theologian. Um, many exist, uh, and we're still deliberating over which is real, uh, you know, do we have more faith in science? These are open questions. Um, so, the, the existence of a single objective reality that we can just go out and measure, 
negates all of the more subjective components of our lives, the things we, we are still trying to figure out. So connected to that singular explanation. So rather than there being one explanation for one event, um, so let's say you know all of you are in this classroom um, because you love the way that I lecture, I would love that. Um, I I'd love that as my singular explanation. Um, but I'm sure there are so many. You know, I, I want a degree. Um, I heard sociology was easy. I heard sociology was so life-changing and amazing. No matter who the instructor is, no matter how awful they are. Um, I, I heard the room was nice. You know, whatever. There could be so many things. I don't know. I might think there's like a big major explanation, which is probably, oh, you know, you all want to learn and you want to have a degree. At some, that's probably mostly right. But I don't have a singular explanation um, because I have no way of knowing. Um, and then lastly, value-free. Um, so the assumption of positivism was, again, and you know, we're not going to read a ton on comp, so you don't have to get into this um, to, in too much detail, um, but a central assumption in positivism is that good research has nothing to do with the researcher, him or herself. Research can be done the same way by any researcher. And our particular perspectives, our biases, do not shape what we do. Now, using the idea of partial perspective, and again, I use myself as an example, I would be very hypocritical and lying if I said I didn't bias my own research, at least somewhat, in terms of the references I read, in terms of the arguments I kind of implicitly want to endorse. It would, be, it would be hypocritical for me to say that my history with gaming, uh, with the education system, dropping out and all of that, if I didn't think that shapes the kind of things I gravitated to. Just looking at my whole experience in sociology, I've tended to study things where people really undergo a lot of uncertainty. Um, and, and so that's just one example, that any researcher, no matter how objective they want to be, you know, when I really just wanted to study call center workers and be objective, I found I was always looking in my interviews with people for that complexity and uncertainty because I was trying to figure that out, something out about myself. Um, so anti-positivism, uh, if you're thinking of two extreme positions, so positivism, we figured it out. We can form literally positive principles that we can build off of. Anti-positivism is saying, let's take a, take a step back, see that the work you're doing, um, there may be many other competing explanations. We don't quite have it figured out. Yes, we've developed methods, which we'll see, quantitative, qualitative methods, that can help us answer questions. But we should be open to the fact that maybe we're wrong. So again, that's something you'll see in the discipline is part of, again, the, the, the greatness of sociology is how built-in criticisms are to the discipline. It's a very reflexive discipline, meaning a lot of thought has gone on um, into its methods and its theories. Um, you know, it's, it's not dominated by one view at all. Um, and again, that, that could be a bad thing if you take a Comtean view and you say, I really want to figure things out. We're not at that stage. Um, and and you know, it's, we can figure many things out up to a point. And again, I don't think any science is at the, at the level of totally figuring out its domain. Um, that's something you'll learn in your undergraduate experience. Um, so the, this split between formal model building, figuring out principles, using rules, versus uh, being more self-reflexive, asking more questions, being open to alternatives, this is echoed in the two dominant methods. The two, again, I'm using the term umbrella. So umbrella just means um, it covers many, many terms. Um, so, so quantitative and qualitative sociology are the two umbrella methods. So each within has many different sub-methods. Um, but, but these are meaningful, meaningfully distinct categories. So quantitative sociology tends to be positivist. Again, not in a negative way. Um, an example of, of, of quantitative research that has uh, borne out many, uh, th that has borne out an important finding um, is research, for example, on the gender wage gap um, or research on uh, the employability of people with ethnic sounding names. 
Um, so research that has done, you know, they've, they've sent out uh, fake resumes with names uh, and see that people with certain kinds of names get more responses than others. Um, and they use as, as their data uh, for, to, to, for these questions, they use the numbers that they get. So quantitative studies are after more measurable findings. So the research question that prompts this research could be, I want to know if men and women are paid differently for the same work. I want to know if people with certain kinds of names are less likely to get hired. I want to know if taller or shorter people um, make more money. Whatever the question is. Um, these are things you can ask more quantitatively by asking a ton of people um, those things. So quantitative research tends to be more focused and more kind of out outcome answer driven. So when the textbook says it tends to be positivist, what they mean is this research typically isn't interested in all these sorts of complex questions about the human condition. They might be um, to an extent, but predominantly they're after an empirical finding and one that's rather simple. Qualitative sociology, by contrast, tends to be much more ambiguous in its outcomes. Um, so let's use a contrasting example. So study A, quantitative, I want to wa ask 100,000 women uh, in North America, I want to ask them uh, what their incomes are, and I want to ask 100,000 men, and I want to compare those incomes and their experiences just in terms of numbers. I want to see if job history impacts wages equally for men and women. Study B, I want to interview and job shadow and maybe work alongside 20 women and 20 men. And I want to see what it is that leads to these individuals having similar, similar or different career and wage experiences. So the way this research works, and you'll see this throughout the course, these should be seen as complementary methods. Um, so oftentimes, uh, a basic finding will be established using quantitative methods. We'll find maybe a startling statistic, like the gender wage gap. And then qualitative sociologists will go out and study why and how that number exists. So they'll flesh it out. Um, so, so again, in this discipline, you'll see, just like with the different theoretical perspectives that you'll be introduced to, these are not enemies, and most research should not just be, you know, hell-bent on one of these perspectives, but really seeing, okay, given my question, am I interested more in a numerical fact, quote-unquote, or am I interested in a deeper interpretive process of meaning-making? There's no privilege to either one of those. They're both equally needed in the field. I'm an example of that, I, in my qualifying exams in the PhD, I wrote the quantitative exam, so I know a lot of that number stuff, but in my own work, I do qualitative. Because again, those nagging questions about meaning and identity are what drive me, um, and I'm not super interested uh, in, in, the, in numbers. I use them in my own work, but I'm much better at kind of talking to people and playing around with theories um, than I am in doing complex graphs and all of that. That's why you'll see my slides are kind of bare bones. I'm not the most tech-savvy person, even though I'm a gamer, ironically. Um, so, okay. So don't, this is a lot of stuff, but this is just context again. Um, we, this is a sociology class, so we're going to be more focused on sociologists. So again, as a hint, that will be, you know, uh, some, some core people like Dorothy Smith, Max Weber, and so on. Um, but, but as I said, there was this moment, you know, I can't, as much as I'd love to delve into the history of this, because this is such an exciting moment in time. Um, August Comte and all of those other people I mentioned, all these other pioneering sociologists, they were not operating in a vacuum. Um, so roughly, so they talk about the political revolution in the textbook. Uh, ranging from the Renaissance to the Enlightenment, and then culminating in the scientific revolution. So in Comp's terms, all of these individuals here were operating in the, theolo sorry, in, the, in the metaphysical phase. There were philosophers or social thinkers that were really trying to develop what would later become more scientific ways of studying things that had previously been studied religiously. So let's look at some examples of this. So Machiavelli, 
Um, so just show of hands, does anyone, uh, has anyone heard of Machiavelli or know what the, the, the idea of someone acting Machiavellian is? Okay, so some of you. So um, just putting it quickly, uh, when, when you say that someone is Machiavellian, um, it means that they act in a way where they believe the ends justify the means. Um, so there's debate over whether Machiavelli himself actually really believed that, but basically it's saying, you know, this is my goal. I know that if I do this, society will improve. It might be brutal, there might be blood, but we're going to do it. Um, so Machiavelli, he sees, uh, the, for, in terms of the textbook, um, he sees human behavior as very motivated by self-interest. That ultimately, we all kind of have that sort of mentality deep down. And you'll see many thinkers debate that. Um, but it's ultimately that we become obsessed with our ends and our goals, uh, and, and our motives can then trump how, how it affects other people. Descartes, similarly, very focused on the self and trying to think of principles of how we act. Um, the famous line, I think, therefore, I am, or cogito ergo sum. He was in dialogue with very religious thinkers and said, ah, the hallmark of humanity, yeah, we, we have a soul and all of that, but the hallmark is really that we have a mind. Um, and, and that was huge for the development of social thought and sociology. Um, as we'll see, we've moved away from Descartes the way we've moved away from Machiavelli. But the central idea of privileging individual thought and agency can be traced back to Descartes in that sense. So now, with the, later three, the latter three thinkers, they're much more automatically sociological in their thinking. So Hobbes is known for his famous work, The Leviathan. Hobbes' central claim, so like Machiavelli, he has a kind of rather pessimistic view of humans. Uh, we're kind of self-serving, we just want to live, we just want to survive. But he also thinks of us as rather crafty. So the Leviathan for Hobbes is the idea that individuals, even though we're very self-serving and self-preserving, we realize that it might be in our best interest to give up some of our liberty, or in the terms of sociology, give up some of our agency to those around us to ensure that other people can't infringe on our liberty. So that's confusing. So what, what that really means is Living in a society, I might give up some of my liberty, say, to the police to protect me, because what they will do is, yes, they'll prevent me from doing many of my activities, but they'll also prevent other people from, say, attacking me or something. So Hobbes believes, again, that then this is where you see the formation of sociology, that humans will kind of inherently reach a point where they say, I'll actually have more agency if I give some of my agency to the structures around me. As someone that taught policing several times, you know, I know obviously when you think of the police, the police do not represent for everybody something that's boosting your agency. For someone that's part of a population that's overprofiled, um, you know, that, that's not the reality for them. But for Hobbes, historically, people enter into a relationship with the state uh, to, yes, curb their agency somewhat, but the real point is protection, so that you can live in a civil world without being looted and attacked and overthrown and all of that. Um, and Locke and Rousseau, I won't go into as much detail. These will all be covered next class, so just for sake of time. Um, but Locke is central for the study of, of the empirical world. Locke said, we've really built up these, these big, highfalutin philosophical systems, and what we should be doing is actually more measuring action as it's occurring. And Rousseau took on Hobbes' position and Machiavelli. He said, rather than starting seeing as, by seeing humans as all self-serving and egoistic and all of this, what if we saw them as actually much more social? So again, these are just little tidbits. They're all questions that still shape the way we view things now. Um, so as I mentioned, the Industrial Revolution, so people weren't just having these ideas randomly. You may notice the common thread among all of the ideas presented so far. They're all really focused on kind of individual capacity and agency, and conversely, social order. 
you know, why is it that people that are so autonomous and different and special and whatever, why is it that we form into associations with one another? Is it that we are actually self-preserving one another? Is it that we're actually inherently really like lovey-dovey with one another? What is it? So this moment really forced people to ask these sorts of questions. The Industrial Revolution, which was when essentially labor and production went from self-subsistence in farms, so people living in farms, producing their own clothes, their own food, uh, living in families with like eight kids with high infant mortality rates, that shifted to, instead of laboring for yourself and your immediate family, and maybe your extended family, to laboring for a boss in a factory. So technology, production technologies were developed to a point where you could produce things much more quickly if you divided the labor up. So rather than, say, having a blacksmith in your town who made all of the weapons or something, um, or, or, or someone who, made, who, who would make all of the houses, you would have separate factories where components of those goods would be made. So Adam Smith talks famously about pin factories, where there would be factor, huge factories devoted just to making pins. Um, and so the, the, the spread of this technology and the division of labor into many different items vastly increased the amount of goods we had in society. This allowed populations to get bigger, but it also forced them out of their current ways of life. So the Industrial Revolution is a very kind of two-storied event. On the one hand, there's a ton of growth, economic growth, um, and, and, you know, early forms of like gentrification, uh, the development of, of, of smaller cities, suburbs, all of these things. But the other side of it is one of pain, of people being forced to move out of rural towns and into these very brutal factories where they would often have to work 16 hours a day at very low wages and would actually be arrested um, for, for being homeless at the time. So many people would resist going to the factories um, and vagrancy laws were established uh, to, to ensure that they couldn't do that. So this long story short, this was a time of tumult and chaos. Um, so the kind of thing I like to study. Um, and so this, this was really people, people's values were being shaken up, their ideals were being shaken up, um, and really the nature of what motivated anyone to do anything uh, became a real question of thinking, you know, is what's happening to society really for the, for the greater good? Because we don't even know what the greater good is. So, th so this, this, again, was a, a, a major time of thought. Um, so macro and micro sociology, so to jump a little bit, I've talked about this a little bit um, for the question. If a sociologist were to study the impact of the Industrial Revolution and they wanted to know how it was impacting the entire society or a large group of people or a large group of workers, they would take what's called a macro effect. As we'll see next class, Marx, Marx and Durkheim and Weber, when he studied the Protestant ethic, we're really focused on this. Again, a, a, a focus that's more interested typically in numbers and facts. Microsociology is, hey, okay, I know the Industrial Revolution's causing a lot of pain and a lot of good things for people, but I want to talk to a handful of people and I really want to understand that process. I want to know with one worker, maybe, maybe even as few as one worker, I want to know what it is about this experience that's causing them good things or pain. I want to see it through their eyes. I will see that more in the contemporary week, but also in the classic week. Uh, people like Mead, Cooley, and Bloomer, the micro perspective comes after the macro. So once people, again, just like with positivism and anti-positivism, and this is why it's important not to you know, trash the prior thinkers too much, as much as they may have become fixated on rules, literally Durkheim's book is called Rules of Sociological Method, as much as they may have become fixated on rules, it was the development of those rules which then allowed these later thinkers to say, hey, maybe you got something a bit wrong. And really that's the nature of science and scientific development, coming up with findings 
and then falsifying them and hopefully getting closer to some version of the truth. Um, so just before we end, so these last slides, um, <laughs> I do really care about Canada, I am Canadian, or whatever, but um, I'm not trying to s s rush over Canada and, and, uh, in, in the last bit, um, but the, the bit on Canada is, is, is important as in terms of understanding structure and agency. Um, so Canada and Canadian sociology are relatively marginalized in the field. Um, it's the, that way for most academic fields, I think. Canada is a much smaller population than the states. Um, our disciplines emerged here later. Our universities developed later. We have less funding, all sorts of things. Um, so Canadian sociology is no different. Um, the, the, the textbook outlines a few things which I think are really important to keep in mind when you're thinking about, OK, how do I think of how Canada developed as a nation sociologically? Um, so number one. They mentioned that Canadian regionalism uh, strongly impacted the development of the field and the way that sociologists approach the social world. So regionalism, so again, Canada, one thing we have that's fairly unique relative to other countries, we do have a strong linguistic division between Ang uh, Anglophone and Francophone Canada. So when you look through Canada's history uh, and the development of sociology, much of our research was focused on ethnic tensions between these two groups. Now, of course, we're much more focused um, on studying a wider uh, array of, eth of ethnic groups, and there's much more research which has long been needed on Aboriginals in Canada. Um, but historically, we've been very focused um, on Anglo-Francophone relations. Um, the ability to survive over time, <laughs> that's kind of funny. That means just literally because Canada's so damn cold. Um, that, that actually more researchers studied how is it that people live in this hostile climate? It's hostile in terms of weather, and we're also like bullied by America. Um, so, so, you know, Canadians often have an America complex because we're like the little sibling or whatever. Um, so, so that's what that means. So again, regionalism and our relationship with the states and Britain. Um, we are kind of, you know, we're a newer emergence than them, um, and so we're often in their shadows. Um, political economy. Um, so Canada's development, Canada historically has been more open um, than, than many other countries. You know, it's off, you know, the, you'll, you'll often hear, um, wear your Canadian flag when you travel, all of that. Don't wear an American one. Um, so the political economy is, that's reflected. Um, we tend, uh, Canadian sociologists um, have tended to see the economic market as very tied up with our norms, much more um, than the history uh, than American sociology has. Um, so the role of politics has been more central. Long story, long way of saying it, politics has been more central in Canadian sociology um, than in American sociology. Um, and related to that, the Canadianization movement and the radical nature of the field. Because the discipline has been historically more political than American sociology, um, we'll see this in the Contemporary Theory Week. Things like feminism, critical race theory, many perspectives which are really focused on social justice and change, those are much bigger uh, and more represented in Canadian sociology departments um, than they are uh, in American ones. Um, America's been moving this way too. Again, I'm not trying to trash anything, um, but just the way the textbook says it, um, it, it, it there is some truth uh, to, to Canada as being or Canadian sociology being more political. Um, so I can't do justice time-wise to the pioneering Canadian sociologists, um, but just a sentence about each. So here are some that were influential. Um, Annie Marion McLean, she did one of the first big quantitative studies. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, the gender wage gap now is a more recent gender study, um, but she did one of the first uh, large-scale quantitative studies. And she did, so, she did so on uh, kind of laboring women, wage-earning women. Carl Dawson co-authored an introductory textbook um, and did many other um, pioneering things in the field. He became very well, this is a long time ago, um, but he, the, he influenced and helped bridge the gap between Canada and America. Um, Helen Abel, so as I said, rural sociology, it still is a very big field. I don't think we ever really have classes in it in, in Toronto. I think just because 
Um, we're not rural. Um, but John Hannigan, a professor here, he teaches a class I TA'd many times. Fantastic. Um, if, he offer, if he offers it later, I highly recommend it. The Sociology of Suburbs and Suburbanization. Um, and so Abel is uh, uh, an influencer on that sort of thought, just thinking, you know, how and why is it that social norms are similar or different um, in low population density agricultural places versus big cities. Um, and lastly, John Porter, yeah, he's the, uh, the most well-known of these names. He wrote a very famous book called The Vertical Mosaic. Um, and this was a study, very hallmark Canadian kind of study, um, where he really wanted to see uh, how ethnic and class stratification uh, was built into our, our Canadian history. Um, so again, I made the comment on purpose. We do often think of Canada as this very open country, but we also have a lot of social inequality. Um, so he was one of the first people to really um, focus on that. Um, and then so lastly, before we go, again, I, I apologize for time. I'm always going to try to end early, um, but we had all this lovely interaction. Um, globalization has a week or two of its own at the end of the course, but I'm just going to introduce it now. Again, we're focused more in Canada in this country, just so we can all, you know, it's good to start with where you live, so you can, and then think about the, the institutions you already know, um, but you should connect this to the, to the wider world, um, especially right now. You know, we're living in a moment where people are becoming very aware of relative uh, income and quality of life differences among people in different parts of the world. So as a sociologist, think, you know, how and why is it that I have the things available to me that some people may not have, um, even in other places in Canada, but, also, but, but in other parts of the world? Um, so there's a map. They, they give a, a nice, uh, not, not nice, I mean, it's, a, it's not good finding, um, but they give a relatively clear map um, on people living less, on less than a dollar a day. Um, so you see, you know, largely in, in Africa, uh, that's where it's most severe, um, but you see in European, North American countries, under 2% of people in most of those countries live under a dollar a day, but many, many more people live on under a dollar a day in other countries. Um, so to end, again, so a little technical thing. So Revel, um, so for Revel, I left the shared quizzes there. You can do the shared quizzes, and just as a little bit of information, um, Many of you did do the, the shared writings um, and the, the journal entries, um, and so I can see them, um, and so it's fun for me to read through them and see what you're thinking. Uh, but they're not graded, so it's fine. You just, you know, I think the textbook, so I, I kept them available because I think they come at kind of logical points in the text, so they ask you to really reflect and think on things. Um, and many of you wrote really fantastic things. Everything was great, and some were really in-depth, and I thought, that's really good studying. Um, so I would recommend doing the shared writings for yourself, but you're only evaluated based on the quiz. Um, and you have like 20 quizzes over the term, so if you don't do that well in the beginning, it's okay, um, because you have so many other ones to, to do. Uh, each quiz is worth, you know, roughly 0.5% of the final grade. Um, so if you didn't do well, it's okay, because the, the kind of the worse you do in a quiz, the more you'll be motivated to study, right? Um, so that's really what the goal is. Um, and so I won't give the assignment instructions for another couple weeks because I want you to, you know, have your tutorials this week. I don't want to rush you into the assignment, um, and then your TAs can walk you through that. Um, so tutorials start this week. Um, so you have two things. If you haven't done the Revel quizzes, I know many of you have, you have to do those by Friday uh, by 2.15, and then you have to do chapter two um, by Monday. Um, and check Revel again, the, the deadlines are on there. Um, and then tutorials start this week. So you have your tutorials either Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. Um, but have a fantastic week. Yay. <laughs>